Hello, welcome to Mindful's Leading Mindfully webinar. And I'm Brian Welch, I'm the CEO of Mindful Communications. It's a pleasure today to be with my friend, Rick Irwin, who is the CEO of Adstra, um, one of the larger data management agencies. And as a matter of fact, our data manager for Mindful. Rick, uh, welcome to the webinar, good to have you here. Thank you, it's so nice to be with you, Brian. You know, it uh, felt like um, kismet that Rick and I were just chatting one day and it came up that he was a practitioner, that he had a, a regular mindfulness practice and that it informed the kind of business person he was. And so I thought it'd be real interesting to sit down together and sort of discuss the whole business of data management of the identity economy, which is a new um, landscape for a lot of people and a very important thing in the marketing world and how mindfulness influences the kind of business people we are and the kind of hopefully the kind of leaders we are. Rick, uh, how did you get started meditating? Sort of by accident. I, I was a big uh, fan and listener of a intellectual and a um, meditator named Sam Harris that you probably are familiar with. And I always enjoyed listening to his ruminations on lots of different topics and then became aware of his, of his book that he had written called Waking Up and read that book and really enjoyed it. And then um, began trying meditation for myself and, and just so, sort of started with, with Headspace, I think was where I started because we had some friends, good friends who had found that app to be useful. And I found I really enjoyed it from, from the get-go. And I enjoyed it partly because it was so obvious to me, it was going to be a lifelong practice. It was going to be a practice. So many things you experience, you know, somebody recommends a great book or a movie that doesn't become a practice, right? That's just a, a one and done. But the first time I started practicing Vipassana meditation, it struck me that it, this could take my entire life to, to learn and, and, and with learning all, all along the way. And so I've enjoyed the practice ever since. Yeah, it's sort of fathomless in a way, isn't it? I think that's a very gratifying aspect of having a regular mindfulness practice that one doesn't reach the end of it. And we, it's almost as though the longer we practice, the more the, the vista opens up, you know, the, the greater the potential appears, maybe. Was there... Were there things about your life and your awareness before you started practicing that that stimulated your interest in meditation? I've always been really interested in understanding how my own mind works. And I had never really been exposed to something that could be self insightful that way. Some people go to therapy for that. And, and I've often thought, well, it would be fun to go to therapy just to be able to understand how my mind works. Um, but this is more or less self-regulated and, and yet I find provides a lot of insights about how our minds work and how they can work differently if you uh, want them to. So for me, that's, that's the thing that sort of immediately I found benefit with that I continue to get benefit from every single time that I meditate. It's a really interesting aspect of it. Some, some of our problems <clears throat> are addressable. Uh, and I wonder if this is your experience, but I find that some of our problems are addressable just because we give ourselves enough space, enough quiet, enough stillness to look at them and get a clearer view of where we're at in our own minds. Is that your experience too? It is, I, I, I didn't know that there was a difference between 
and I'm not sure if, if the if I'm using the, the terms technically correctly, but in the way I think about it, I didn't know that there was a difference between contemplation and meditation. Yeah. And so for me, if I needed quiet time to think about something, I would go and to a, a place that was quiet and restful and and I would think. And I believe a lot of people who, who, who are less familiar with meditation or haven't tried believe that meditation is thinking with your eyes closed. And <laughs> one of the things that I've learned is that contemplation has a place in my life for sure. And I'm sure in most people's lives, but there's this different place, which is mindfulness meditation that yields a whole different outcome. I never solve a problem in my life in a meditation session. It's a different, it's a different thing. Um, that's, that's very well put and an excellent point. And there are, you know, there are practices, contemplative meditation practices, yeah. where typically, I think you start out in pure shamatha or vipassana meditation, and then give yourself a point out there in time where you're ready to settle in and think about your problem. Right. I, that's, that, that's an experience I have yet to have, blending the two. That would be a fun chapter at some point in my meditation journey. It can be cool. Um, why don't you explain for us, from, in the way you do, what Adstra does, your, your company? What Adstra does is helps brands connect and communicate better with their consumers. And because we help brands to do that, we also help partners that brands rely on, like their agency or their uh, various providers. And we do that through the specific application of this very uh, sometimes counterintuitive and hard to understand world of data and for us, when we talk about data, because the whole economy works on data now, um, the, the type of data that we're referring to at Adstra is data about who consumers are and what can be known about them that can help the brand serve them better. And does that have a benefit for the consumer as well? It sure does because now to consumers are often relying on brands that are huge faceless corporations. And yet we're trained and rightly so as consumers that we are king in this country. The customer is always right. So the challenge is for the brand that is often a very, very large, sometimes a global corporation to be able to interact with the consumer as though they know them and have a, a real relationship with them. And even though that's never going to be like the corner store owner who you've known since you were a kid, it's, it's not going to be like that probably. Consumers do want there to be an understanding of their history with the brand and their loyalty to the brand and how they interact with the brand because we're all time impoverished. and as consumers, and we don't have time to teach the brand all those things about our preferences. So it really does have benefit uh, to the consumer in feeling like you're known to the company that you're spending money and often relying on for various things in your life. Are, are we getting better at, I'm, you know, I'm thinking from my own consumer experience, what I would like is for the messages I receive from the brands to be more targeted. I would like them to be more aware of what it is I'm really interested in. Is that still evolving? Uh, because I mean, it's like, I'm thinking of like uh, Amazon, I bought some underwear on Amazon. And so for three months, I was every day getting ads about underwear, but I already bought the underwear. I'm not right. like, I'm not like an aficionado or something. I just needed right. some, some shorts, right? You're not an underwear collector. I'm not a collector um, yet. Um, <laughs> So are we getting better at that? Is that something that's evolving over time? We are in a, in a number of ways, we're getting better at that. Um, one way 
is more and more of the consumer economy is made up of direct relationships between the brand and the consumer. And if you think back on, on you know, most of our life history, certainly the first part of our life, there, there were very few products, consumer products that were routinely purchased directly from the manufacturer. And increasingly, that is a, a more uh, prevalent form of, of commerce. And so that puts, a, that puts a, a, an onus on brands and an opportunity for consumers to have a closer and more uh, full and, and, and knowledgeable relationship. And that's in fact what's happening for even for many brands that, that grew up not, grew up using dis distributors between them and the consumer. Um, consumer packaged goods companies are a good example. Even those companies are increasingly um, doing more business directly with consumers. And that's one way that this bond is getting closer. Another way is technology. Technology allows brands, sometimes very large corporations, to organize what they can and should know about the customers that they have better and link things together. There's an old example that, that was long ago resolved, but is familiar and intuitive enough that to, to share that American Express once upon a time had a challenge because each of their different credit card products like the green card and the gold card and the platinum card was each managed by a different business unit within the company. And each of those business units had to acquire new customers, new card holders every year. And so they would send solicitations often through the mail to do that. And, you know, through no um, malice aforethought, sometimes the gold card um, team would send an offer to a platinum card holder, not knowing that that was sure. an, all, an already a, um, a, a customer of a, of a higher order product. And so um, technology now allows us to help the brand make those connections so that that sort of thing doesn't happen. And for you, in your example, that results in more relevant uh, messaging. And less underwear. <laughs> and hopefully less underwear when you don't want underwear. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, in a way, isn't it kind of true that even if I buy your product, let's say you, you make the protein bar that I like to eat. Um, even if I buy your product at the grocery store, you're still going to be out there working to meet me personally through social media or registering email lists or whatever. Right. I mean, it's like every company, even retail driven companies are kind of media companies in this landscape with with, you know, thousands or millions of direct relationships with consumers. Yes, that's 100 percent correct. And that's also a function of uh, of technology. We when I first got involved in the in the business of data and identity, maybe 25 years ago, more than that now. Um, the notion of con a consumer experience happening across many forms of technology and many forms of media was very much a dream and very seldom a reality. <laughs> and today it is, it, it's really fun for me to reflect on a career in which you can see the achievement of something that really makes the consumer experience um, better over a period of time. And that's, that's what we've seen happen in, in really, especially in the last five to 10 years, it's accelerated. So, you know, there's the idea that our, that mindfulness practice, that, uh, that is self, the self-awareness that we believe comes from it, maybe generates the potential for us to be more conscientious as business people and business leaders. I'm just sort of wondering, you know, there's, there's a lot of negative attention paid to the aggregation of consumer data, you know, to the fact that we are all in business learning more and more about consumers day by day, aggregating data, becoming more sophisticated in how we use it. Mm. 
how do you view the present, the past, present, and future of the sort of ethical questions around around data aggregation and data management? Do you have? It, it, it's it's such a great question. It's been central to my whole career in this industry, and and I'll tell you, um, there's certainly an um, an overlap in terms of mindfulness as we think about it in the context of meditation with being mindful about the right thing to do in industry. But I will say there, there need not be an overlap. The overlap is coincidental because, because in my view, being a practitioner in this, in this consumer data industry confers an ethical obligation on one to do the right thing that has nothing to do with whether you decide to ever learn to meditate or become a practitioner of, of mindfulness or any of the uh, meditative um, uh, sciences or arts. And so uh, maybe this is a function of the first company I worked for in this industry, but I've always thought it was a very, very serious obligation to, to be extremely uh, thoughtful about managing consumer information um, well. So for example, one of the implications of that in, in, my, in my industry, in my company is we don't manage the kind of information that generates a ton of controversy around social media, for example. And so we're, we're right now hearing a tremendous amount of rather disturbing from my point of view, um, revelations about what what can a, what a social media platform can do to move millions of brains via the limbic system in a direction, whether they're trying to or not. Um, that is because the data that is being used to to do that is the very most precious personal information, which is what you read, what you do with what you read, how you share with other people what you read. Well, my company doesn't, doesn't manage that kind of information. The kind of information my company manages is that which is publicly available or permissioned by the consumer. And it tends to be much more descriptive information that if you were walking down the street past a consumer, you could observe yourself about them. Um, and and that, that is a whole different kind of information that in my view is, is very useful for building relationships between brands and their customers and very um, unuseful if you want to foment an insurrection or, or, right. or right. get a million people to you know, to, to vote a certain way. It's just not something that I've ever had any interest in, in, uh, in managing or being a part of, frankly. Yeah. I just want to remind everybody that we'll take questions at any time. And here on Zoom, you can just open the Q&A panel and type a question in uh, and we'll see it right away. And I'll try to attend to as many of those as we possibly can. We'd really, in, we'd love the give and take though. So saying all that about, you know, how the limbic, how the, the social media drives the limbic system and the limbic system drives the social media, do you mm -hmm. think maybe there should be a limit to the data that the, the social media platforms are collecting on us, are the behavioral data? Uh, yes. I mean, this is, you know, this is a very big and complicated topic, but the most, the simplest answer is um, I, these companies are publishers. They should be treated as publishers. Yeah. You know about publishing and um, you have responsibilities in your business as a publisher. And uh, there's, a, there's a reason why uh, the social media platforms have very specifically gone out of their way over the years to say, we're not publishers, we're, we're technology platform. We don't publish anything. And of course, um, most people I think know that that's not the case. And it, it's, but it's convenient when you're, technology platform and the infrastructure, specifically the algorithms that are able to decide what a person sees and, and, um, and what 
what what they see in relation to what they've done the, those that infrastructure is actually there to publish information for people to read and it's just convenient when when there's so much of it and it would be so hard to be a responsible publisher it's convenient to say well I'm not a publisher because it really would change the economics of the business model probably you could argue would destroy the business model um, from a financial standpoint if those companies had to behave and be as responsible as publishers have to be. The, um, I think it, I think for a lot of people, it's not apparent that in a way, the big social media platforms are sort of following the instructions of their users in the sense that they their algorithms feed off of engagement they feed off of obsession mm -hmm. they and and people become obsessed when they are triggered by mm -hmm. a subject when they feel a strong partisan inclination toward a topic and so you know i i know what the social what my friends that work for social media platforms say we're just listening to the users mm -hmm. and making the experience more engaging for them mm -hmm. um but of course e even if it's drawing out their very worst qualities and aggravating the worst feelings that they're experiencing in fact you know in a way aggravating their suffering do you see that at all the same way that i, just I do i do yeah. i do and that's the um now, the, there is an interesting possible connection between the practice practice of mindfulness meditation and your experience as a consumer and a user of um, of Twitter or Facebook. And the, and the connection is, for me, one of the great benefits I've gained from learning and practicing meditation is the ability to concentrate to the extent that you can recognize how to react to something. Yeah. That is the opposite of the way social media platforms are designed to operate. They're designed to make it impossible for the human brain to think about their reaction. And that's maybe counterintuitive to people who aren't in that business. And, and I don't mean it to say, obviously not everything that happens on a social media platform is a, is a bad thing. It's just that the, ba the, the, the bad hijacking of a brain um, via the limbic system and the good hijacking of a brain via the limbic system uh, are, are both the same mechanism. It just happens that the good hijacking of the brain doesn't sell as much advertising. Yeah, exactly. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, uh, Greg Wolf has asked us if there's uh, a way that Adstra can help email marketing and direct marketing um, to the audience that they've captured on social media. In other words, is there a way you can take a social media audience and help uh, a marketer convert it to a marketable audience in email? I think that's the nature of the question. Um, is, that, is that something Adstra can facilitate? It is, we, we, we do that regularly. And there are many ways, uh, many ways that that, that, that can work. Uh, we, find, we find one of the most basic ways is we have a number of customers that, that have, uh, now in, in data-driven marketing, one of the things people are focused on is first party data, the data that comes directly from the relationship with a customer of a brand. And many brands don't stop to realize that the visitors to their, to their web properties, even if they're not, even if they're anonymous visitors, that is first party data. And often we're able to help brands understand how the audience that they may have already marketed to in any medium, including social media, is already a regular, has already become a regular visitor to their site. They just don't know that yet. And right. there are hundreds and hundreds of ways that a brand can become smarter about 
who their who their customer is and and, and how to speak to them. So for long- instance, planting things in the social media that drive them to an interaction sp- directly to a specific interaction um, or a registration at their own site, right? Absolutely, uh, that's then, a that's a very a very common one. Just to, you know, just to give a sort of fundamental example, you put things in the social media that aim people at a very particular point of engagement on your site, so you yeah. know that everybody who lands there is being funneled from the social media. That's yes, and and that's that's a, that's a great example because that's the case where uh, the the that type of product lends itself to an immediate conversion from an ad, but there are many products and many brands that that's not how it works. You know, airline tickets don't work that way. Typically you might be in the market for a trip, but if you're not, uh, you're not going to click on a United Airlines ad and buy a ticket normally, unless it's a, some remarkable offer that you can't pass up, but still United Airlines would like you to think of them because you saw an ad and perhaps explore a part of their site that is offering deals for the for spring break and that that's not going to be a conversion possibly but it's still important for the airline to know that the advertising drove uh some awareness and some follow-up action and all of everything in between awareness and a conversion is our interactions that the brand wants and needs to know about that we help them understand better and everybody's building audience right now. I mean, right. every kind of company has an audience and every right. kind of company is building audience. I mean, they, as, as we were saying earlier, like every company's media <laughs> company. I was wondering, Charlie Swift asked, and I think it's a lovely question. I was wondering uh, about your reaction to his suggestion that, you know, the, the need for the social media companies to take a higher level of responsibility might be analogous to alcohol companies accepting some accountability for drunk driving and mm-hmm. and changing their marketing tactics to include messages about driving responsibly to warn people about the dangers of drinking and driving. Is, it, is there a parallel there for you? I, I think there's a parallel. I think it's it's part of the notion of when we decide to to participate in a business career, I have always felt it's important to not be harming people. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be evil. Is that the that don't you, be evil? I guess was the was the famous uh, Google one. It, it, um, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which somebody could maybe critique now, but um, but I think it's a very personal thing, and, and it makes it it can make it hard to talk about because. You know, we've probably all known somebody that worked for a spirits company, or even somebody who worked works or worked for a tobacco company, who you consider a friend and an ethical person. So it's you know just an affiliation with a company can't be the standard upon which we decide whether a person is ethical or not. And after yeah. all, corporations we we talk about them as though they're people, we treat them legally as though they're people, but of course they're not people. They're collections of actual people, and it it makes it important, I think, for uh, companies to make sure that that collection of their people has an, an ethos that is doing the right thing. And so, uh, so to me, it's, it's it's quite clear that that should be a part of all of our lives, and hopefully, that will become the future in in social media, and for that matter, any other company that is operating legally but maybe doing things that if done wrong can be very harmful the other thing that comes to mind is is the um pharmaceutical companies that 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 deal in opioids might might even be a a slightly more apt analogy because um that's not an entertainment thing in a a way you could say alcohol is large you know spirits consumption is largely a, a a recreational pastime when it becomes a problem for somebody, it crosses a line into something else. But opioids, um, for the most part, when legally used, are therapy are meant to be therapeutic. And we've seen now that through a combination of lack of oversight and perhaps even some people doing the wrong thing, you can create an epidemic of addiction in communities that can least afford 
that kind of addiction. And so it's just, it just underscores how important it is for companies to have an ethos around, uh, around not hurting people, not harming people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think there's any question that the, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical <clears throat> manufacturers bear a very large responsibility for the opioid epidemic. And I mean, I have a personal interest in all of it because I, one of my children died of opioid addiction. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is the, the big insurance companies can give you real precise numbers of how many painkillers are going to be prescribed in a given period of time uh, for, you know, the normal clinical reasons. And that's something that the actuaries track year in and year out. We have mountains of data about it. And those people manufacturing those, uh, those drugs knew that they were manufacturing many, many orders of magnitude more than the clinical landscape would dictate. And then they were, you know, of course, driving the sale of those drugs very aggressively through their marketing. So I kind of think their culpability is pretty clear. Yeah, and the parallel that I'm drawing back to social media is um, much of what goes on inside social media companies is very, very good. I mean, just think about sure. um, well, well meaning and appropriate political organization across the whole political spectrum is made more effective by social media. Um, I, I have a cousin who said this to me several years ago, we were talking about this same issue and she said, well, it's, it makes knowing where to show up to, you know, to support a candidate so much easier. That's all for the better of our society. Now you compare that, which is a perfectly good thing to what we now see on company letterhead, on social media company letterhead from the whistleblower documents. And they're in possession of, of information about foreign countries literally being effectively overthrown with yeah. the change in government because of the very same, you know, technology, if you will. So, we, so there, there clearly is an ability to let one, the good one, flourish, the, the, the benign one flourish and find ways to reduce or even choke out the malignant ones. Yeah. And therein lies the ethics. Well, and the opportunity to do something meaningful, but also maybe the responsibility, you know, uh, one of the folks with us uh, just asked, is it possible that the technology companies have even greater responsibilities than publishers? And I suppose considering their power to track behavior and mm -hmm. the profoundly powerful ways that they engage that capability, maybe they do have even greater responsibilities. Maybe, you know, real judgment calls need to be made about what's responsible and irresponsible behavior on the social media platforms. And maybe they should be paying people to do that. It's an excellent point. And, and look no further than the user count in these companies. You know, when, when, yeah. when one of them claims 3 billion users, uh, there is no company on the planet, there are few anyway, that can claim to have almost half of the population of the entire planet using their service. That confers a huge obligation. Right. Or you know, as, as direct marketing has evolved, and this is another question from uh, one of the folks who's visiting with us today. Um, how much should we listen to consumers about the form in which they wish to receive communication from? Uh, that's a really great question. Well, I had in, in uh, graduate school, I had a consumer uh, behavior professor who, who said, and he was a wonderful, you know, very optimistic person, but he said, you have to understand consumers always lie, but they don't usually mean to lie. <laughs> <laughs> they just lie. And, um, and it's, I found that to be true my whole career. I'm laughing. I'm sort of smirking because I'm remembering some talk show. One of the late night talk shows did the thing. I might have been Jimmy Kimmel did the thing where they did a person on the street interview, but the person on the street didn't know that underneath the sidewalk, they had put a scale uh, that could actually weigh the person as they were being interviewed. 
and they just did this thing to say, you know, they'd ask them a bunch of questions. And then one of the questions was, how much, and how much do you weigh? And they would yeah. have off to the side, the actual weight as registered by the scale and every single person likes Obviously that's a sensitive topic, but it turns out consumers um, will often express a preference and then almost immediately will belie that that's not their preference. And oh, they're yeah. not, and they're not out of maliciousness or an attempt no. to hide. It's just no. something we're not thinking about every decision we make every day. Well, and the fact, you know, we laugh a lot about the similarities between, let's say, blow-ins, those cards that sure, you yeah. put in magazines that people can use to subscribe, and interstitials on the website. And there's yeah. a parallel there, because if you just ask, for, I mean, it's the thing people complain most about. Why do you put those cards in? They fall out. It's super irritating and interstitials. Those interstitials drive me crazy. They keep popping up. But the fact is, both blow-ins and interstitials have historically been incredibly valuable. Yeah. People really do utilize them to engage with us in big numbers. And you know, we can hardly imagine doing without them. But if you did a poll of consumers, they all hate them. And I suppose maybe the maybe the the maybe what's going on there is. I've hated every single one of those cards that fell out of magazine, except the one that fell out the day I wanted to, to subscribe to that magazine. Yes. Well, I'm glad you brought it up, Brian, because it's one of those topics that has informed my own sense of ethics, what's right and wrong in this industry. And, and, and I, I don't know that I can put a, some quantitative valence on this other than to say, um, I have always just decided for myself, as with my fellow leaders of the companies where I've worked, what the reasonable <clears throat> standard of, of potential harm is. You know, you heard me earlier say it's important that we not harm our cons customers or consumers. And to use your example of a blow in or an interstitial, I just decided a long time ago, I don't think those represent harm. To a, to a consumer. I right. just don't think they represent harm. Some people, particularly if you, if you really, you know, look at sort of people who are, you know, very, very, very strident privacy guardians, they include anything a consumer doesn't, you know, appreciate in their life as a violation of their privacy. I personally just don't agree with that definition. I think that our society runs well when we have reasonable standards of what a person should be able to avoid in their life and what a person should just take in stride. Same, same way as I don't think if I'm walking by a billboard, if that billboard offends me, I don't think that billboard should be taken down. I think I should not look at that billboard. And I also feel this way about a lot of um, media, you know, if it's offensive, turn to, turn to a different channel or, or, or whatever, which I think covers, which I think covers a lot of these things, but that's very different than the topic we were talking about of social media, where you're being served up the channel that the algorithm knows is going to tick you off. <laughs> and that, uh, that, that's out of your control as a person. And that's why I have a different feeling about that. Well, I think you can make the case that, that any algorithm that's intentionally trying to make us angry is doing us harm. And, yeah. you know, that's probably not okay. I agree. Um, have you incorporated mindfulness practice into Astra? I mean, is there other ways in which I clearly it's influenced your, your strategic orientation and your style, your leadership <clears throat> style? Is it a part of the Astra organization in any way? Only, only on a personal level. I think there have been a couple of times when we've um, discussed it as, a, as, as one of many things that can uh, be beneficial. Uh, especially during COVID, I think we talked about it a couple times, but I think it's fairly personal. And one of the reasons I think it's personal is that um, <laughs> the first time many of us hear about it, it can come across a little bit, um, you know, granola. And, <laughs> and, uh, and some people then think, well, that's not for me because that's one of those weird, you know, one of those weird things that I don't participate in. And so I, I think it's more interesting when a person can come to it on their own and, 
and find it valuable. And I also know a lot of people who have tried to learn to meditate and it's just not, they don't think it's for them. And so I'm reticent to, um, I'm reticent about doctrine around it uh, or even promotion uh, of it personally, uh, even though I know there's no uh, harm to it. So no, but it's, that's an opportunity for Astro to maybe do more of that down the road. You know, we do, we do the simplest things. I mean, even though mindfulness is our bread and butter and the only thing we talk about, right? You know, we don't, we don't impose it with a heavy hand. I don't think you can. I don't think it's productive, but we like start, we start meetings with a minute of silent meditation very often. Mm. And we often bow in and out of meetings as a sign of respect, just a couple of little things. Those are wonderful. Um, I love that. You know, that, that keep us in mind of what we're doing, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I do, um, it, it brings to mind very early in my career, uh, I worked for this big printing company, R.R. Donnelly. And they, at one point, they decided to expose all of their executives to uh, cultural, it was, it was framed as cultural training. And this really interesting firm came and did this training. Um, I'm not sure if the firm is operating in, anymore, but the patriarch of the firm is a guy, I think you and I might've talked about this, Brian, is a guy named Larry Sen. Yep. His firm is called Sen Delaney. And they did this training and, and R.R. Donnelly was a fairly large, it was maybe a $5 billion company at the time in revenue and you know, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand employees. And so this training was very expansive and it was technique based. And so as an example, one of the techniques was this notion of be present, a hundred percent present in whatever you're doing. If you're having a meeting with somebody, if you're in a, a large meeting, don't be looking at your phone. Back then it was whatever it was, your, your PDA, your uh, Palm Pilot or whatever. Blackberry. We were, yes, yes, yes. This was even <laughs> Blackberry, but yes. Um, and that, that notion of be here now was one of maybe 50 techniques that, that they introduced and would reintroduce and, and we would learn over time. Well, only much, much later when I began my own mindfulness meditation practice did I realize Larry Sen had designed every one of those te techniques were from the practice of mindfulness meditation. Yeah, but effectively a 2,600 year old set of practices. Exactly. Right? And, and he just had decided, and I think wisely so, that don't frame it as such, just frame it as executive techniques and skills. And so your comment about the ways you all have, have woven it into business reminds me that there are many, many ways that you can bring these techniques that don't have to be billed as having anything to do with my mindfulness into a company and have great benefit for the way people in the company work with each other and accomplish work together. Yeah, we certainly believe that. You know, we do a lot, a big part of our business is corporate training in this space. And, you know, for our own folks to sort of keep up with it, we just offer as a benefit to all of our employees um, a, a very generous benefit for engaging with meditation teachers, going on retreat, um, getting whatever formal training feels right to them in the general mindfulness space, which includes a lot of different things. And so uh, Lori asked if we teach stress management or mindfulness practices in team meetings or staff meetings. You know, we do some of that. We have a weekly uh, meditation drop in that's open to everybody. We have monthly sort of lunch and learn sessions with meditation teachers. But from a manager's perspective, I have found it more valuable to loosen the purse strings a little bit and just offer to pay for people's meditation teacher for their private instruction for a retreat or a course if they want to take it and then folks get to choose an avenue that's inviting to them which uh which has worked really well and it's really fun it's exciting to see people evolving on their own path well we will explore that with with you because that could be 
very helpful to us. Um, we have a question about databases and the publishing business. Uh, Greg Wolf has asked, you know, he says cooperative publishing databases have been a technology that has been a game changer for magazine direct mail. Is there anything new coming down the line that could take magazine direct marketing to the next level? Um, and I, I, yeah, please. go ahead. No, please. I, I do think um, it's funny in, in the, in the data driven, or I should say digital media world, um, because magazines and catalog and omni-channel e-commerce has been data driven for a long time, but in the digital media world, that notion that Greg brings up of cooperative sh data sharing that drives a benefit for the both the, the the donor into the cooperative and the and the uh, recipient uh, in digital media that's kind of a a taboo topic and I found it interesting it's been it, it's really been a taboo uh, the first time I encountered it as a taboo in in digital media was the first time I met a retargeting company, which, which was this company to told me a long time ago. And their founder is this brilliant guy named John Giuliani, who, who uh, I remember we were, we were, my company experience was, con was uh, considering acquiring to And we said, well, this is just like our cooperative data business. And he said, oh, you can't use the term cooperative in this world. Um, so it's still a bit of a taboo topic, but what I see coming down the pike which, which will be this same concept is the notion of um, cooperative identity resolution. It turns out that, um, you know, in, in, in data-driven marketing where the expression in media will be a, a form of digital media, there's, there's uh, often an unsatisfying match rate of your your audience base, your customer, or whichever audience you're intending to reach to whichever form of digital media. And of course, this is what onboarding companies have sought to, to help with. But even in those cases, the match is far from perfect, often far less than 50%. And I think this is an area where, where coming, coming down the pike, we'll see a lot more opportunities for brands to only share their identity connections, not the transactional information that you know might also be valuable, but would actually predict what the person might want to buy or read in the case of a publisher, but just to get the all the different forms of identity that exist in the digital landscape to get those resolved so that the publisher can better uh, reach individuals that are likely to want to interact with their brand. And you're using publisher in the general sense of anybody, yeah. build, everybody building audience, which is like everybody, right? Yes, yes, I am. And, and also specifically underscoring it in the magazine context that Greg uh, raised in his question, because I think it's an op a, a very, very large opportunity for what we used to think of as magazine publishers, and we now think of as, as omni-channel omni media companies. It's a big right. opportunity for them as well. And, and there, we all know that many of them are struggling uh, in the face of social media to remain viable and relevant. Um, so we have one more question from my friend Connie on the, she just is sort of wondering why is the, why is the internet so noisy? Why are the, why are the social media platforms so packed full of points of engagement, websites packed full? I mean, she's, she sort of longs for an aesthetic experience with more space and and more uh white as a in a, for a uh, in a word white space in the in the digital environment do you have a why do you think so much is packed into every page why is the noise level so high well i at the risk of oversimplifying uh i believe it's because there are two um internet economies, one that has been dominant and one that is on the ascendancy. And Connie will really like the one on the ascendancy, or at least she might like it better. The, the one that's been dominant is the advertising economy, economy or the advertising-based internet, where all of that 
stuff that we now have access to was made possible, most of it, because advertisements were paying the freight. This is, of course, how radio started and how television started and uh, became powerful um, media. And now, of course, we see, just as we saw what happened in radio with satellite, went to a subscription-based offering with fewer ads, and television initially went to cable, which is subscription-based with no ads, and now, of course, there's ads on cable. But increasingly, you're seeing Netflix and the streaming services are once again resetting the clock with an ad-free experience where you get to decide how cluttered you want it to be. Yeah, that that subscription based uh, internet economy is really on the ascendancy, and I don't think uh, my personal belief is the two will always coexist to some extent. But for and those they fluctuate in kind of a cycle, right? Indeed, you know, yeah. I think over indeed. the course of our careers, we've seen subscription based economics improve and then collapse, and then yeah. again, and you know, that's the pattern, right? And I think that pattern will. There's no reason to believe that pattern won't continue. But the great thing for Connie and others who want a less cluttered experience is increasingly you can define what you're willing to pay for and and how you want that content to appear in front of your eyes, and that's that's a great thing for consumers who care and. Obviously, it can, there's a little bit more of a cost associated with that, so it might not have the same broad-based um, appeal that the advertising-based internet will. But but it's an option available more and more now to to all of us who who can afford to pay for that content. Thank you so much for joining us. Is there any other anything else you'd like to cover while we're no? Talking? Thank you for the great work you all do, and and you're a great client of ours, and we're just thrilled to to intersect in more ways than just our normal business relationships. So thanks for having me. It's nice to work together. And thank you all uh, for joining us. It's fun to get to talk with you and have you in the room, in the virtual room with us uh, for an hour or so. Uh, again, this is the, uh, is, this is Mindful's Leading Mindfully webinar. And I'm um, just very proud to be part of your community. Have a great day.